Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to give it a few more minutes. My guest speaker, we're still waiting on her, so hopefully she'll be here in minutes. Um, so if you just kind of chat, and then as soon as we know more. <laughs> Yeah. 
Actually, everybody, thanks for your patience. We're just waiting for another board member to come in and we'll get started. At least you're in air conditioning. <laughs> But um, while I'm waiting, I'll just kind of talk about, um, we've got Shelby Purdue here, and she's with um, the firm NOAC Cover. They are like the experts in the DOA and help us draft this latest DOR, along with Lonnie and then the Document Management Committee. So those are the ones that they have the outside expertise. And she's going to be here to kind of explain a little bit and then take some questions. Um, so we'd like to take advantage of her while she's here to direct any questions related to the DOR and the POA Act to her. And then we can continue with the open forum after we get some of those types of questions out of the way. Um, this is going to be our third open forum that we're doing, so um, it's supposed to be where you have a chance to ask questions, but what we like to do is when you ask a question, if you could just ask one question so we can move to the next person and then we can come back around versus if you've got four questions, we want to just make sure we can get to everybody. And then after that, we will have the board meeting starting at 730. Um, we will have an open forum again where you can ask questions for the board. And then after that, we will have um, questions to the potential new candidates that are going to be elected that were in your packet that just got mailed out. So we've got a little bit of a long day, but um, this one kind of moved as well. So with that, um, this is uh, Shelby. And I'm gonna get her, well, get her my mic, I guess. Get her my mic. And then um, if you've got questions, I can come around with the microphone to help out so everyone can hear. Oh, you thank you. Uh -huh. right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and this is why I'm loud enough, but I've got a little bit of sore throat. It's okay. So I will try my best to make sure that everyone's comfortable. Um, my name is Shelby Purdue. I'm with the firm um, Nomad Power in Atlanta, and all we do is represent the Little's Association and Condominium Association. So this is what I do all day, every day. And so I spend a large portion of my time talking to people about the Georgia Property Owners Association. Um, I've been um, returning for about 14 years. I said it has a baby today, so people. Don't believe me when I say it, but I um, have been practicing real estate law for quite some time and um, have um, been involved in lots of different aspects of um, real estate. And uh, I work for the state of Georgia and did all of their um, leasing for, for the state of Georgia for, for several years. Um, they, they wanted me to give a little bit more background about myself. So um, I, I have a degree in construction man management and building science. So real estate related items are, are my passion and have been for years. Um, let's see, um, a brief history of the Property Owners Association Act. Oh, I'll just, the Property Owners Association Act was first um, brought into effect in, um, and put into statute in July of 1994. So it has been around for a while, but in order to come under the Georgia Property Owners Association Act or the POAA as we refer to it, 
you have to take affirmative steps to do that. And it is essentially a, a set of a statutory scheme that is similar to what condominium associations have, except for that affirmative action that you have to take in order to submit to it. So when associations are typically formed in Georgia, even now after 1994, and we have the, the Property Owners Association Act available, developers don't tend to want to um, initially submit to the POAA. Um, it requires them to pay association assessments and those annual um, dues. And so they don't necessarily want to submit their development to that initially. So there's two different kind of ways that it happens from there is the documents will be blank. They don't say anything about it. So there are common law homeowners associations, which you Fairfield is now is a, a common law homeowners association. The other way that developers kind of put this in the language is they sometimes allow for boards to take that action on behalf of the entire association. So that would have to be specifically in the documents. So newer documents that we're seeing do sometimes allow for the boards to take that action on behalf of their association. Um, but either way, it has to be done formally and adopted and then recorded on the land records. So if it, you know, the association adopts it and they never properly record this and don't give notice to any uh, potential future buyers, there's lots of problems with that. So where you are currently is not very different from where most homeowners associations in Georgia are at some point um, in their establishment. Um, I've been with Noak Howard for a little over a year, and I've probably helped 15 different associations go through this process to, for, to vote on, on uh, adopting the, the POAA um, and a whole bunch more in, in, in the queue right now. Um, about half of the associations I see decide that this is something that's really important to them primarily because they want to address some type of use restriction issue in the future, like leasing. So if you are a common law homeowners association in Georgia, you cannot adopt any further use restriction without having the consent of each and every individual homeowner to that change. So if you were to move forward now without the adoption of the POAA, only those people that specifically said that it was okay, or they, they said, I'm in agreement with the, the leasing new leasing restrictions, it would only apply to those specific lots or units. Um, there, and it wouldn't um, be uniform across the entire association. Um, so in all reality, the only way to really move forward and have the uniformity of those future use restrictions is to adopt the POAA and then be able to move forward with the leasing restriction with a two thirds vote of the total association membership for those that are eligible to vote. Um, so that's kind of where we are now the association is, is we've got to look at adopting the POAA so that you can move forward and have those, those additional leasing restrictions that the community is looking for. Um, so that, that's a little bit of like the background on the, the POAA. Do you guys, I know that you guys have lots of questions about it. Um, and I can go through some of the, the benefits of that. Is that where you would like me to kind of head now? Is like, why would anybody move forward with this if they weren't interested in use restrictions? Um, so right now you can make amendments 
to your documents as long as they weren't considered one of these further restrictions on the use of the property. So if you wanted to adopt a, a bylaw change and um, move forward with changing the number of members that were on your board or something else that was more administrative, um, there wouldn't be that need to have the consent of every member. But the, the POAA allows you to move forward with adopting that with the with the two thirds vote. Um, that's really the biggest appeal is that amendment process that is allowed for by the the statute that by those statutes. Um, so as I understand, you guys are, are moving forward with the the POAA and your leasing restrictions together, and so you're going to have to have a pretty high threshold in order to to get those in place. But it is not a hundred percent where you need the consent of each and every member of the association um, to really have that uniformity of any use restrictions to apply. Um, so that's the biggest thing that typically gets people to looking at that the Georgia Property Owners Association Act. Um, the other things that people really like about um, the act and is good for homeowners association are the automatic liens. So if there is someone that's delinquent, you have a statutory lien for those amounts, including any attorney's fees that would be incurred to collect those amounts. So if someone wants to refinance their home without going to court and getting a judgment and reporting that, there is a lien on their property that would need to be addressed before you could move forward with a property sale or a, a refinance. Those things would need to be addressed because there is a lien on the property. And that gives the association some teeth in um, being able to enforce those um, assessments that are, that are in the documents and being able to um, collect against people that that aren't paying their dues. So there aren't really significant changes if you're paying your annual assessments and you're doing the things that you need to, to do to comply with, with your, your documents. There's not any huge changes unless you're someone that's not paying or who has incurred fines. Then you will have these automatic statutory liens on your property, but that saves the homeowners association money and time from having to go through the court process to get to those liens. Part of that is also the joint and several liability. So the, the buyer as well as the seller would be responsible for the delinquent amounts if those were not addressed at a closing. So if someone moves forward with a buyer, with a real estate agent, doesn't really know what's going on, they don't ask the right questions, they don't get um, a statement from the homeowners association and move forward, it's, it's not addressed at the closing. The, the association doesn't lose that. They could then go after the seller and say, this wasn't addressed, you've got to, to do something about this. This is still a lien on the property um, and you're responsible for it. And so that new homeowner would have to figure out how they want to, to deal with that. Oftentimes they go back and negotiate with the buyer or potentially their agent because their agent didn't necessarily do, do their, their due diligence in this because this is now part of the, essentially your deed is these statutory liens because this is recorded on the record. So everyone has noticed that there's potentially outstanding the statutory liens if there are delinquencies on the property. So, so, so can I ask a question? So, mm -hmm. so we can do that today without it. It just yes. costs money. It just costs money. See? So it's it's something we can already do. It's just it's, it's time consuming and costly. The POA Act 
makes it easier and less administrative and less cost. Yes, so you, the, the association doesn't have to go and seek out an attorney every single time there's a delinquency and then get a judgment and then go record that on the land records in order for it to be valid. It exists because you submitted to the, the association is submitted to the POAA. There is that statutory lien. Um, and it, it's, it's automatic. There's no additional steps or burden on, on the homeowners association from, from getting that. Um, there's also additional statutory um, provisions that allow for um, uh, late fees. So those late fees are in statute. And if they were later potentially changed the um, by submitting to the POAA, those those could potentially fluctuate. Um, but those are, you know, of course, subject to whatever the legislature's um, doing at that point and would be, um, we would never allow for those to go down. There would be a big um, stink. Currently, it's 10% of the past due assessments are a late fee. And then there's a 10% interest on those 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 late items um and it also allows you to recover the the reasonable attorney's fees that are actually incurred um so you can get those um the costs that the association is actually having to do to go against people that are delinquent um and recover those expenses which I believe that those are currently in your documents. Yeah, I yeah. all of that already exists. It, it exists in your documents, but it's also backed up um, by the, the language that's in the statute. Um, another portion of this that I believe is also in your current documents is the ability to fine, but these things are now in statute as well. Um, and to suspend the use of amenities um, so if someone is delinquent or has fines, the association could move forward with cutting off their access to amenities or potentially even gate access is something that we sometimes see um, is a, a restriction it is you don't have to let necessarily allow for car access um, to a person's um, home if they are significantly delinquent, suspending um, those um, rights to use the uh, amenities could potentially be restricted as well. And part of that is your, your gate access. Um, another thing that the, uh, the statute uh, focuses on is a perpetual duration. That's not a problem for, for you as a, a homeowners association. That's currently your your document automatically renewed, so that's not a problem. Um, the other really big thing, other than the statutory lien aspect, those automatic liens, is the ability of a association to move for foreclosure without having to pay off any superior liens, which means if there's a first a priority mortgage on the property that the association could move forward with foreclosing on the house and take that subject to any type of mortgage. So right now, the association can move forward with foreclosing as a common law association, but it would have to first pay off any mortgage that was on the property. And so that's not really feasible for, for homeowners associations to, to take that step because associations don't have those deep pockets um, necessarily to go and pay off $100,000 that somebody has left on their mortgage in order to be able to move forward with foreclosure. Um, with that said, the foreclosure process is not something that the association can just go and then auction off at the courthouse steps. It is a judicial process in the association. First, there's got to be a delinquency of over $2,000 by statute. There's a, a minimum threshold. Um, so it takes some time in order to get to 
that $2,000 delinquency amount. And then there's this, the judicial process that you have to go through. Um, you've got to send a certain amount of notices, a certain time, time limit. You have to then file suit. You've got to get a court order from a judge to pursue foreclosure. Then you've got to go to the county. The county does additional uh, research and checks the title on the property before moving forward with foreclosure. And then it goes to the sheriff, the local sheriff's office, and the sheriff's office moves forward with actually the with the actual auction um, on the courthouse steps. And those typically play, take place on the first Tuesday of the month. So this is a long process. It typically takes between six months to a year from the time that you file suit to actually get to the point where there is an auction of the property. You sometimes you see those those horror stories on the news with the, the little old lady who is being foreclosed on by her homeowners association. And most of those stories are missing some essential piece of information that she has received notices. It's been published in the local newspaper for at least four weeks that all of these things have to be checked off before you can even get to the point of submitting those things to the sheriff's office to move forward. So there is a, a high threshold um, to doing that. And the association the, the board that you elect has the discretion in when to move forward with those items. So just because someone reaches that $2,000 threshold does not mean they automatically have to move to foreclosure. If it's not a situation where that should be um, pursued, they have the ability to make that decision um, in, into to weigh all of the different factors, including those human factors that may be involved. And that's one of the biggest things, responsibilities you have as members is electing the board. Like you're getting ready to look at who has the, the, the credentials and who has the passion to be um, leading the association and, and looking to doing those things that are in the best interest uh, of your community um, for the for the long run, and oftentimes that's not foreclosing. It costs thousands of dollars to get to move forward with foreclosure. Um, right now, we're quoting approximately three thousand dollars in attorneys' fees to move forward to filing a foreclosure uh, to seeking an order of foreclosure. Um, so it's not something that the association is necessarily wanting to pursue because the association will have to pay for that and hope that they get repaid at, um, the, at the foreclosure sale and can recover those fees down the line. Um, so they will have to flood those um, for a significant period of time. Um, so it's not something that's they're not going to just say your two thousand dollars delinquent. We're foreclosing on you next week. It is it is a significant process um, to to pursue. So are those kind of the big. Nuggets? Yeah. I want to make sure people have enough time to ask questions. Okay. Um, are you okay? To... Yeah. Okay. So why don't we open it up to some questions? We wanted to provide a little background before we got to questions. Yes. So I was hoping that my understanding would be that if I were to buy a property, um, the title search that would be done on that property would let me know whether any liens have been recorded against that property. I mean, just think about all of this stuff with POAA, um, what recourse I would have as a buyer, you know, as a buyer if my um, well, let's see. Real estate agent didn't do due diligence. How could I, you know, cover myself? Doing that. They have a title insurance company. Well, that is part. 
Title not insurance not won't cover cover lanes. this no. this particular type of lien. That will not cover it. But as part of your due diligence, the the assumption is that it is recorded on the land records, and therefore, under the law, everyone has notice of this by the association submitting to the POAA. Any buyer should be able to go and look and should receive a copy of those to know that there's potential for those delinquent amounts to be statutory liens. Um, that's, that is the, the recourse. No, they don't have to be adopted on the lien, lien records. So traditional land records, um, title searches won't bring those up. But experienced closing attorneys, experienced real estate agents should be very aware if there's a homeowners association involved, they need to seek out and get a statement from the association before moving to closing. Um, I would say right now, just with this being a homeowners association, they're you're getting inquiries yes. on, on yes. this. Yeah, you're getting they're getting inquiries um, about that. On, on a regular basis, are there delinquent assessments that could be liens that need to be addressed in closing? So does that fall into the two hundred dollar closing letter fee? Like if you had well, multiple buyers, that's what offers? we charge now under mm -hmm. the POA Act. We're going to charge ten dollars, okay? Because that's statutory. So it, it actually will go down. It, it, the statement is statutory, ten dollar amount. For other administrative items, the association could charge more. But for that statement, the it's step by statute at ten dollars. Sorry, that statement is coming from our POA it or comes from the POA, POA, which is the state. No, no. it would it, that would be a letter that you are looking for from the homeowners association, from your your board or from from your um, managing um, company. And maybe just to clarify that, so if you go through a closing mm -hmm. period, right. your real estate agent and or, or your attorney will typically contact the office, if any good one would, and say, can you give me a statement plus the documents that you have related to that? So that's that happens now all the time that they ask for those. Does that clarify that a little bit? Does, the PO, there is no like, Board or POA a board, it's all about us internally. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, yeah there's yeah. not a new club that you're joining yeah. through, through the secretary of state. Yeah. That that that's that's not what the the property owners association that act would would do. You would the buyer would need to seek that out from the the association. And that's my concern because there are uh, new agents out there or underdeveloped agents out there. I mean, a friend of mine just had a really big issue with uh, an inexperienced, I guess, realtor, and she ended up popping up a money for a mistake that was made by that realtor. So as a buyer, it's, I like to think that I have enough knowledge to at least take care of myself going to yeah. the closing process. And most of those closing letter requests, that's what we, most of the time they're called, that's what they're called, um, they just come straight from the closing attorney or a paralegal from their closing, a closing attorney. We wouldn't release it necessarily to a real estate agent right. unless we have a signed agreement from Except. from you as a seller we can release that information it's typically requested by the uh, closing attorneys office <laughs> this would change it to where real estate agents and buyers can go straight to you where they're going to still it. still it have to be the same. Same. it's still the same same, same. Requested to right before closing right yeah it, yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah it's diligent it, it, yeah. it, it could potentially and delay a, a, a closing. Delay. That's something that occasionally happens. But if the closing attorney is doing what they, they need to do, and by statute, they these statements have to be provided in a, in a timely fashion. Do some due so, diligence, though. I mean, according to the GAR contract, it's a set period. So if this is due diligence, shouldn't we get that letter out in the beginning? 
Assuming we're asked for it. If so, we they, wouldn't they know it early. is happening unless that's so what happens. Happens. It, it doesn't that happen to necessarily, but it has to be something where we know that we have the ability to release the document to you. Because we do have, you know, under the bylaws, there's only certain things we can release due to privacy issues. So unless we know, in fact, the person we're releasing it to is the correct person, we can't release it. So you can take contract, so you have all right. contracts, you have to have a Or frankly, the seller can come in and ask for their own. Because yeah. they're they may not just it to the buyer, yes. it's going to be responsible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's, a lot it's of even to the point that, I mean, that's a, it's, it's the same process that we do today. It's just that, so it wouldn't But be now if you've got a buyer, it's going to be responsible if the seller didn't You're correct. disclose it. And that's problematic. Mm -hmm. That's always problematic with sellers, though. Um, sellers yeah. don't disclose lots of different things. So mm -hmm. if this is moving forward the way it should be, and you have a 30-day due diligence mm -hmm. piece, period it gets to the closing attorney then then the association should respond uh, timely and they have that that closing letter and that statement um there any other questions <laughs> yeah when i read this when the food authorized documents say you've got the number the list of people that can live in their house. Mm -hmm. And it's very limited. Yes. I mean, I got a girlfriend that's, um, she's at Bay of and at some point we're going to have to have a living oh, yeah. person to live with. Them. And for this, I can't have that. You can have that person live there as long as an owner is living there too. So what it, says. It, it is what what it says later in the documents about who is who it applies to. It says you can have a partner, but it don't say you can have their kids there. It, you, you can have their kids there as guests, but not as authorized occupants to live there so without the having an owner. Well, let me ask you a different question. Are you renting to them? Or are they living in your home as a guest? Mm -hmm. I said, are you renting to them or are they your guest? Because then it's not included. It's not included if they're your guest. Yes, sir. Yes, can only stay in your house 90 days. It, it, and it is, guests can only stay in, in your house for a specific period of time. And that is in order to close certain loopholes that we've been seeing in short-term rental. Oh, this is my, you know, ne ne nephew and niece who are living there, they're house sitting, but what's really happening is there's some rental agreement that's again, there. That's not, not being you first. not being there. That, that you don't live there. That that's you the don't other. live there. That that would be them living there in the home as their primary residence without any owner being there as well. That's not what that provision says, but when you read it in it's in this clarity. Can you point it out? Thank you. Why don't we move on to some of the, the next questions and I can I yeah, can take well, a look at that specifically. I, I just want to make sure don't we have provisions like that in our current documents? Aurelia, Lonnie, I just want to make sure. Is that correct? Is there nothing like that? We don't have a rental return. But is there something about guests and ownership and who can stay in the house? Well, can't do Airbnb. Is that what you're talking about? We don't have anything else. Well, I guess that's probably the best way. We'll get that document. Yeah. Uh, Councilor, can you can you comment on is the process any different that if somebody buys a lot 
and they intend to to build here, but they move to Tupelo and they no longer want to do there and they're not paying their dues and not communicating, not doing. How's that process different than what you explained about an actual house and a foreclosure? You can foreclose on a, a parcel of a empty lot just like you can foreclose on a house. And I think for your association, that may be the one of the biggest reasons to move to the POAA is to have that ability to go after those bot owners that have never paid, that have never paid anything. And then the association no, can, can get those lots back and sell them and get somebody in here that actually wants to own the lot and pay their dues and develop the property. Thank you. Who's going to be responsible for those assessments? The new buyer? Who would, it, it would on. be the buyer that's uh, uh, that's responsible for that going forward, moving going forward, forward, but yeah. not forward. What was they asked. would they would understand that they're buying a a lot that's had been through foreclosure. There are this amount of assessments that mm -hmm. are, are outstanding mm -hmm. on that property. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the concern about the leasing cap is with investment firms and hey. And got companies buying up rental properties. Is any of this, or does any of the POAA statute apply to past due uh, dues that are unpaid, say by rental companies or individuals? It doesn't matter who the owner is. Mm -hmm. it, can, can it go back? It, it can't go backwards okay. necessarily. Once you adopt this, the statute of limitations to go back and um, get those those dues is four years from the date of filing of a suit. So if you come to, to know our power to, to, for us to move forward with collections, we'll say, okay, we're gonna go back four years and see what's outstanding. And that's what we can, we can pursue in collections. Yeah. But that, that statute of limitations is also what is currently in place if you were to move forward with, with collections as well. Under the uh, section 44.3.2.6, uh, section E, it says that any amendment, proposed amendment, would automatically be voted as a yes in favor by mortgagee if they don't respond within 30 days of being given notice of a proposed amendment. Yes. Uh, in the past, and I've been here over 20 years, in the past we've had multiple attempts of trying to do amendments to do special assessments to where they can oppose a one-time special assessment and the same amount as what our annual assessment is. And those amendments have always failed, but it's taken a lot of uh, meetings like this and a long period of time for people to be able to research it and find out whether or not that amendment was going to be beneficial or not. Does that, this cap that to where you have 30 days or it's automatically it's, going into place? That is only for the mortgagees. So Wells Fargo holds your mortgage. You we would have to send off a notice to Wells Fargo. It goes out into, you know, their Netherlands somewhere out there. They don't respond. Then they specifically have been found to have consented to that. It doesn't apply to the any of the homeowners. It doesn't apply to any of the homeowners. It's only the process for um getting consent from mortgagees so the, those those banks typically banks that are that are holding those those mortgages so the, the amendment process would be the same as what has been in the past the amendment process i think you had talked a little bit about special assessments and special assessment pro process is a little bit different than the amendment process well, no, there were amendments to create the special assessment which got voted in advance that's not, not exactly how it happens. There has to be a vote um, to move forward with special assessments if they're over a certain threshold. That's, I don't have your documents memorized, but that's typically what is what is necessary. You have to vote on those. Um, and in typically you have to vote on amendments. The threshold for special assessments is typically lower than amending your documents and making a change to the declaration that's recorded on the land records. Special assessments 
are not recorded on the land records. That's something administrative that the association does. Yeah, and it goes, it's going to go to a higher threshold to change our documents by adopting the DOA, which is, is somewhat also a little concerned. That was one area that we were hesitant about because if we have to get to a higher threshold by all the community in order to change our DOR in the future, if we adopt a DOA, there's, I think it's two thirds. It's two yeah, thirds. It's, it's the previous one, if I remember correctly, was if it got put into place, the board can at any time on their own, without us voting on it, can apply a one time special assessment if that had gotten put into place. I correct? think there is a, I don't, I may be wrong, but I think the special assessment can be up to the annual amount of, am I correct? It requires a vote. Okay. It's a we can do a special assessment if we put it out the vote. Yeah. yeah. But to change the documents, it's a higher threshold. Okay. Okay. I suppose that I own a home in a lot of And I said that I want to move to Alabama. Okay. And I rent my property out to my daughter. And there's not been any assessment paid, no fines paid in quite some time. How is this going to help the POA to recoup these fees. Okay, so you own the property, you're he's saying, he, he, he's saying he owns owns a, a property, he's renting it to his, his do daughter, hasn't paid assessments for a long period of time. What is allowed under the POAA? And I would say, what's allowed under your uh, proposed leasing amendment. Um, under the proposed leasing amendment, you assign the rents to the association. So the association could potentially pursue the rents to satisfy those outstanding amounts. That's one of the, the, the ways, or you're still the owner of it. They can pursue any type of statute, potential statutory lien. Look. My daughter is not actually paying any money. Well, then, then that's that's that is different. Um, but if she is a tenant, and you're not staying there, she under this she's an authorized occupant. She you can allow her to to stay there while you're not living there, but she could potentially be considered a tenant, and you could assess those against her personally because tenants are responsible for those actions. So if there are fines that have been caused by that specific tenant, the association could pursue the tenant for those items. Yeah, you could the long-term process of there there is it would it would not be an easy thing to to pursue it would be more complicated than going after a, an individual owner for that um but that is something that can be pursued yes. uh, so that you're aware though our current document allows us to go after the tenant already yes so why is it done by when? Oh, Although, I don't understand you don't the understand? specifics of who you're talking about, but I think most everybody does. Okay. Well, you do? we're we're not here tonight to talk about the specific. Right. If you want to address those later with the board, you're you're welcome to do that. Yes, ma'am. I understand. Same scenario, but you're he's been paid. He's already paid mm -hmm. early. But you're saying also if you have if you pay, if you also is, you get fined. If you have a tenant that's out there misbehaving, uh -huh. that's so the fines affect the the, the, the fine. You're paying, you're paying on time and everything. The fines are affected. They, as they are now in your current documents. If so the fines your, your fines, paid the, on time. the fines would need to be to be paid. But those are against the tenant as well as the homeowner, as your documents currently are. And the fines are set by 
the the fines have to be reasonable and they are set um by the board typically at their discretion. Sometimes they're in documents. I don't think they are. Yeah. It's, all, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all all posted. Yeah. They're they were saying it's online. There's a schedule that's set by the board that sets forth those finding amounts. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Yes, ma'am. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Question. Is it dealing with this um, example? It's not his situation. Um, is it? Say he did own the property, or one owns the property, wants to move out of state and rent the property to the seller. Um, and all there are no fines, all assessments have been paid. Would that uh, agreement go into the 15% cap? No, that part, that daughter would be an authorized occupant and would fall under one of the, the situations that's allowed outside of that cap. Correct. And I think that's what I was trying to say to the other gentleman. That list of authorized users is basically who's not affected by the rental cap. Are those people listed? And everybody else falls under the rental cap in some form. Does that make sense now? That's why it says the owner, a parent, a person in law, a child or a stepchild. Those are all people who are authorized occupants of the piece of property. That they're allowed to stay on the property and reside in it as their primary residence without a owner being present with them. Do we have a question here? Yeah. Okay. Thank I you. just wanted to clarify what is the percentage um, that we need to have in order for the vote to pass to agree to the POAA? To, to agree to the POAA? For it to pass. For, for it to pass. As I understand there was an amendment that combines both submission to the POAA and the leasing restrictions. In order to get there, you've got to pass it by the, the higher amount, that two-thirds of the total eligible vote of the association. It doesn't have to be 100%. Can the board give us the number? We haven't got all the totals yet, but we, we'll update. I mean, we're not going to Publish them, but we'll know if we reach percentage, the percentage that we reach. So, quorum. Yeah, what the auditor does is tell us whether or not we have a quorum or not, but they don't tell us yeah. other no. stuff. And the vote is open until September 15th? Or until or we, need to or until we reach a quorum, which like will be longer than September 15th. Okay. So, yeah. Do we have a question here? So, yeah. My concern with the leasing cap is just it's a because we live in kind of a unique community here where not part of it's homes, but part of it is townhomes. So that's where my big concern is. is townhomes are a little bit different in the sense that people don't generally buy a townhome and live in it for 30 years. It's one that typically is more short term or is more often leased out. So I'm worried that if the townhomes are included in that 15%, they're going to eat it all up. Because it's going to be, you know, if there's 23 years of free yeah. 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 I'm probably the answer to this. Yeah. 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 Um, so we we included everything that was fee simple, and the townhomes are fee simple, the timeshares are not in the calculation. The 15% is every piece of property that's already leased in here, plus giving us some room. So it it's a larger number than you would think because we have a large number of houses in here, but it took every single property that was fee simple to that number to 15%. And we figured out that it, that doesn't cut anybody off from having a lease that already leases. And then it gives us a little bit of room for some people that, that may have a situation where they need to move. So to still have a lease. So uh, everybody will be grandfathered yes. in. Anybody that's currently leasing can consider can continue to do that and then additional people can also be considered and, and then on the flip side is as we're building new houses it, it, it goes up. yes bit. the so, number would change then if we get more fee simple yeah. houses the 15 percent would grow so it's going to flex with that as so we expand often house houses decide who gets to rent so like my parents and i both had homes in here for close to 30 years but unfortunately, in the past four months, everyone decides. So we now have five properties 
and they have been away for four months trying to clean up all the mess. And yeah. they're concerned that we don't want these companies coming in and building just a profit and you know with the intent of uh, renting those. But at the same time, now they're a little concerned what happens if they just don't have the money to continue what they have to do over there and they need to rent them. So I bring these money so I can get them next season. Like they're currently on the hardship exception. Maybe fifteen percent is true, then it's not. We're not picking and choosing anybody. It was like I said, the people who already have leases can continue their lease. We did not want to cut people off. Then there's this room to grow. It's a first come, first serve. We have a leasing list basically that we're going to keep at the POA office. As people finish their leases, they'll get crossed off, and those people will have those housing numbers will come back, so there'll be leases available. But it's first come, first serve, you get on the list. And then there is also, as she was saying, a hardship exception, meaning we might have reached the 15%, but somebody has a hardship, we will consider those on a case by case basis at the board level. So if there was to be a death and there needed to be a short term period, that's something that the, the board would consider as a potential hardship. Is there a question here? So Donald, I guess you guys will have a chance to ask me questions later. But <laughs> um, I just want to understand this for a base. We're talking fifteen percent. What is the base number right now? What that we have? Because I, I, I think it's. I think the last count we have, which you know, we'll do it every year, May first, is the count, the reset based upon the number of developed lots every year, be fifteen percent. But we were at 175, I think was what the last email, which would have been probably in April or May that we looked at was the amount of homes that we have leased here. And I think the 15% is going to get us up to like 220 or 230. Yeah. If I remember those numbers, don't quote me on that. But I thought it was 185. Right now. Over 200. It could be. But so the max of that would be 200 versus right now we're at what, 170? I think we're close to 180, but I'm, I don't know why I think that number, but I think mm -hmm. I, <laughs> again, it's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I think you need to understand the context because when you say 15%, we need to know what base number, yeah. we need to understand that that number can change and that that was that much. And then the other part that we're talking about is the form, right? Is that what's that, that total, that number is based off of? Um, well, that's what, and also it's based upon the delinquency factors and things of that. So I think what we'll do is just separate that out and send it out. We have over 1,800 developed lots. Um, we did it as developed so that the individual lots without homes wouldn't count. Um, and so I don't remember the exact, I want to say it's 1840 something, but I'm not 1840. 1840. 1840. 1846. Uh, I just want to make sure that we're having kind of a question here. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I have a question. I don't know if it's already been asked or not, but I want to know do the board members represent the show office or do they represent the community? They represent the community. They, <laughs> That is their function as the board is supposed to look out for the best interest of the entity that is the community association. And so when we present something that is a concern to us and we present it to you, then she was saying, who, what vote is it? That, because it's, it, this has been going on for years about, especially the POA group. Increase mm -hmm. and we don't have uh, what we have from the same. Yeah. I have a question about the responsibility of the POA board. Mm -hmm. So, we can so we need to see yeah. that to that to that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, I kind of lost track of the refinance thing. What responsibility do we have as far as refinancing is concerned? So if the re refinance is essentially doing another closing on your home. You go through all of the the typical documents and the, the title search that would need to be done. So before you could refinance, if you had past due assessments, 
those would need to be paid off before the um, the bank will let you refinance. Right. Yeah. And to save the process, yeah. the closing attorney contacts. Closing attorney is going to going to contact. In, in that, the the Georgia Property Owners Association app is only it's only for if you are delinquent. It's only for those people that haven't paid. It's not an additional fee. It's holding those people responsible that have not stepped up to their duty that they've known about. You're, you're yeah. I'm, I'm just trying yeah. to educate myself here, but yeah, it, real, it, but I just want to it's, it's, a, it's another it's another tool that you have to get someone into compliance that hasn't been paid. Yes, yes. We'll take one more question here. <laughs> As a um, owner of a rental unit, under uniform charge, which is uh, on page six, item D, will I have to pay a leasing permit for something that is currently rented? You may have to pay any type of administrative fees that would be imposed on those individuals that are leasing, whether you're currently leasing or you're leasing in, in the future, if at that time on May May 1st, um, when they they do those administrative assessments, you would be responsible for that that uniform charge. And if I have a one year lease, I will owe that every year. It, no, you. It would be whatever is being imposed. Just the one time. Yeah, it's one, one time. It's one. Yeah, I don't know what. One time per tenant. So it's a five years. Yeah. So you change. Uh, I guess per tenant is probably a bad way to put it. So say you're renting to Mr. Mrs. Smith for three years, you're only gonna pay it once. When you change to Mr. Mrs. Pike. Then you, in theory, would change it because you'd redo your lease with us and have to pay the fee again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you change your, your tenant changes, you'll have to change, you'll have to pay the fee again. Yes, because you need to refile your lease with us. Yeah. For, because, for instance, otherwise your tenant doesn't have cards to get in here without refiling your lease. It's a pass through expense that the association doesn't, doesn't yeah. give to any homeowners that are not leasing. It's only paid by those individuals that are that are leasing. So you don't have to absorb the the expenses for people that are serving as landlords. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well um thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, um, as I mentioned this is act one tonight. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a little bit of intermission. And then we'll start up with the board meeting in about 20, 25 minutes. And then we'll have an, another open session where we'll answer questions. And then we're going to have the prospective board members who are running come up and we have a chance to ask them some questions. So we've got a few more acts yet tonight. So, but yeah, and if you could, um, for the open forum following the, the the board meeting, if you could just sign up to the open forum in the back. And if you have any questions for the candidates, you'll put those in the box right back there.